Oh, this is awesome. What kinds of people popping on. Yeah, they are. You might be right. We might get a crowd. Mabel. Yeah, we are getting gonna get started in a bit. I got one more minute. It is 559. Do we know if Lillian's coming, Mabel? I'm not sure. Yeah. She sent me a note. She wants to get back it's into heavy. the leadership group. So okay, awesome. Maybe she's getting back out and about a little bit. Hello, everyone. This is Hello. Penny Wilson. Hey, Hi, Penny. Penny. It's good to see Penny. you. Yeah. Hey, Laurie. Good to see you too. Awesome. I'm just really feeling like so blessed right here. I see so many names I know. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. Well, Way look, we, we are going to go ahead and get started. It is 6 p.m. And I wanted to welcome, every, welcome everyone to one of our eco um, webinars. Um, I'd like to thank Ben Barker, who is providing us with technical support and supporting Sherman Park Community Association in these eco endeavors. Um, first up, I'd like to also um, introduce a couple people here um, as well. Uh, Steve O'Connell, who is a resident in Grassland Manor. Um, Lori Banks, who is going Hi. to be our presenter tonight. Um, Lori is a former master gardener, also a avid gardener, and also a resident of Sherman Park as well. And also we do have um, Tim Perkins, who um, will also share some information with us tonight as it relates to our tree blessing that's coming up. Um, but as, and, and Joe Fitzgerald, also from the Water Commons, who will also share some information on tree um, uh, health. Because um, in Milwaukee, some of you may have noticed that you are getting new trees in front of your house and you need to know how to take care of them. So um, Joe is gonna share some information on that. So Ben, if you'd like to um, include my slides, we can just wanna share a bit of information um, with some of the upcoming events. So, um, for those of you, can you, everyone see the screen? Mm -hmm. right. Yep. So tonight, as we mentioned before, it's the backyard planting webinar, how to plant vegetables and flowers. And also Lori's going to talk about fruit trees because she has a lot of those in her yard. Um, in addition to that, May 22nd, which is Saturday, it will be Earth Day in May at 9.30 a.m. We'll start off with the cleanup at Sherman Park. There will be the um, Milwaukee Tennis Education Foundation Serve and Connect Tennis Program happening. We'll also share some information on reckless driving. Um, Steve O'Connell will be there. Um, in addition to that, we'll have some housing resources and also some outdoor environmental um, education as well. I think Ethan Taxman will be amongst us uh, to talk a little bit about rain barrels. Um, and then also, um, been, uh, we'll have the tree blessing on May, tw May 24th at 9 a.m. on 50 55th and Center. There is a rain date of um, June 5th. So just in case it does rain that day, uh, we'll reschedule to, this, to the 5th. Um, and then also on June 10th, we have our Milwaukee Solar Shines um, program. It's a webinar that will be hosted on our platform, the benefits of solar panels, how to purchase and how to get them installed. Then the next slide, please. Um, for those of you who are able to come out on Saturday, May 22nd, you may have seen some of these yard signs that popped up in the neighborhood. We'd like for you to come and pick up a yard sign. Pitch in, help keep Sherman Park clean. And on the other side of that sign is Sherman Park is an eco neighborhood. And this again is a partnership through the uh, city of Milwaukee eco office. And um, again, please come out on Saturday, May 22nd. Next slide, please. If you'd like to get more involved, if you have anything else you'd like to share, please email me at mabel at shermanpark.org. So, um, Pastor Tim, did you want to uh, say any words? I, may I ask a question? Yes. 
May I ask a question, Mabel? Sure. Okay, it's Barbara Toes. Hi, Barbara. I'm just, hi. I'm just looking at the email. Should there be an R in there? Or oh, no? thank you. I got a typo. <laughs> okay, everybody, you saw that. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. <laughs> Mabel L. Barbara gets the prize. S H E R. <laughs> Thanks, technical support. There we go. Shermanpark.org. Thank you, Barbara. You're so welcome. That you can get involved um, with some of our eco programming, <laughs> our cleanups, all of that good stuff. So, on that note, I'm going to go back to Pastor Tip. So, thanks, Barbara. No, oh, thanks, Mabel, and thanks, Barbara. You get the prize. <laughs> you found the missing R. <laughs> missing R. So, uh, thanks, Mabel, and uh, just want to invite people uh, to a. Uh, tree blessing for those of you who live especially in the Uptown Crossing and the Tri-Block neighborhoods around 55th and Center uh, near, near one of our post offices in Sherman Park. You'll notice that there are some new trees there plant planted to replace um, a large number of trees that were planted there uh, a few years ago but unfortunately um, died as a result of drought and the inability of um, to keep them watered in the way they need to be watered. So with, in partnership with their, our environmental collaborative office and our eco neighborhood group, um, and in partnership with hopefully TriBlock and, um, and the Uptown Crossing, the forestry department has planted six new trees and we are developing a watering plan to make sure that they thrive and flourish and grow to, to their full adulthood. And, provide shade and, and comfort for people coming out of the post office and people walking in that neighborhood and people. So this is just one example of the kinds of things the eco group is trying to um, initiate in partnership with many of you who have been doing this good work and green work for a long time and will continue. Um, so on, uh, on uh, May, uh, May 20, what was it again? Four. Right there, May 24th, it's right in front of me. May 24th at nine o'clock, there will be a tree blessing. Damn it, why can I not hear it? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, heard I love the things that happen on <laughs> Anyway, May 24th, a tree blessing at nine o'clock. And uh, if, it, if, if it rains lightly, we'll still go ahead because that will be a sign of the blessing to the trees. But if it's a downpour, we'll reschedule for June 5th be a short ceremony we'll maybe have some refreshments and an opportunity to hear about the plan for taking care of the trees so it's an opportunity for us to celebrate our eco initiative and greening sherman park so i hope you can come um, and we'll have something on the sherman park website so that's my presentation uh, if anybody has any questions also feel free to email them to mabel or and mabel can pass them on to me as well yeah thank you for that all right, um, so let's get started and let's talk about some backyard gardening. I know Steve O'Connell is um, now in his backyard and um, Steve, if you wanna introduce yourself and um, Lori uh, Banks, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, um, that would be awesome. So uh, you can share a little bit about what you are doing in your backyard. But I think this is gonna be great information for all. So my passion has been gardening for forever, literally. And uh, my belief is that our backyards can be productive year round if you're really into gardening. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight. And as we go through the slides, um, I'll introduce you to some of the different methods that I use. Um, so, Lori, do you wanna pitch in here or do you want me to go first? Uh, Steve, I'll just introduce myself and then yeah. let you go first. Uh, so I am Lori Banks. Um, I am one of these souls of Milwaukee that really hasn't ever moved more than a mile in her entire life. I went from 50th in Congress to 42nd in Glendale and now live off of Medford and Roosevelt. So I have lived in the same area for quite a while. Um, I am, like I said, a former master gardener. I took the course, passed the course, did master gardening and then had children. So I ran out of time to do all that volunteer work. Um, I have been gardening since I was very little. I picked it up from my grandparents and my parents. 
And um, it's just, it's my absolute passion. Uh, I not only do it during the spring, summer, fall, but I also garden indoors, which you'll see some uh, pictures in the winter. That's great, thank you. Okay, Ben. So one of the things that I'm really into is uh, rain barrels. Um, a number of years ago, we in the neighborhood um, had a project about really beginning to get ourselves out of the uh, lateral system. And so we adopted, oh, at that time, we painted 85 rain barrels one Saturday alone, just to get people to disconnect uh, from the city water um, and to keep water out of the deep tunnel. And so one of my passions is to always paint the rain barrels and they all show the different teams in uh, the Milwaukee area and Wisconsin. So this is the Brewer one. And then along the side of my house, this is where I grow um, rhubarb. So that just about every little bit of land around our house has got something growing somewhere. Um, so next slide, Ben. One of the other things that I do is composting. Um, and so those are my four compost piles. Um, the big round one, uh, right in the corner there on the right side, I took apart the other day and it's perfect soil. Um, and so that's my newest compost pile. Um, those other three, um, the back one behind the big round one, I took a compost pile, you'll see it in a minute, that I had last year and I topped it. I took the stuff off the top and transferred it. And now that's my newest compost pile this year and brown and now the green is on top, uh, the grass clippings and everything. So that's a real active one. Um, and of course, a rain barrel up on the back where I collect all the extra water. Um, that one's painted like a barrel. Next slide. And right uh, that um, the soil there is basically last year's compost. Um, and so that's what's called a mound garden. And so I use mound gardens uh, for things like pumpkins and things of that nature. And that is brand new soil from last year that will become uh, the mound for this year. Um, and so that's a prime example of what you call a mound garden. Okay, the next slide. There are the rain barrels, the Packer one over there on the other corner. Um, and so I've got both of them lined up, um, the overflow uh, hoses and then down below are the spigots for drawing the water off uh, for the gardens. I do not use chlorinated water at all in the gardens. Um, the best water is basically the water that God sends us. Okay, next one. And this is a perfect example of spring gardening. This started literally back in April. Um, and this is spinach kale and radishes. And so I have what the girls call the Conestoga wagon, the covers over it. Um, that's PVC pipe um, with the covering. And I nurse that along with heaters um, during the early spring. Um, and we've been eating out of that now for two weeks. Um, that's almost, that's gonna be gone another week or so. Um, and so that's a prime example of how to garden through even in the cold weather. And I use little hot plates and I hang them in there um, and just keep it warm during the uh, really cold time in the uh, spring. Next slide. So Ben, there you go. Oh, these are, <laughs> this is between the two houses. Those are all raspberries. <laughs> I literally started out with two raspberry plants about 10 years ago. And um, that is one phenomenal raspberry patch. And, uh, and Lori will show you some of her berries, but this produces raspberries like we feed the neighborhood. People just come over and pick raspberries. Um, it's, un it's, it's unbelievable, those raspberries. Okay, the next slide. Let me know when I can do that, Steve. <laughs> Barbara, just come over and visit. All you gotta do is cross the street. Um, and these are the raised gardens. 
Um, and these are called veg trugs. And I have, as a lot of you know, I have a very bad back. Um, and so I've gone to these raised gardens and um, all the soil in there is soil that I basically grown in my compost uh, bins. Um, so that's really rich soil in there. Um, and it's phenomenal the amount of stuff you can produce in those raised gardens. As you see, they're a V. And so the middle of that uh, raised garden is deep enough for any rooted crops you want to put in there beets, carrots, um, that type of thing. And then on the outside, I grow all the lettuces and the greens and things of that nature. Um, and as you can see, the chives are in the other one in the corner. Um, so we've got four of those. Uh, these are the six footer and a three footer. Um, and so it's again, the same as on the other side. And I think we got one more slide, don't we, Ben? And there's the other one. Um, and that one, um, that cover actually comes with that uh, veg truck. Um, and that cover is perfect. Um, and that's full of um, all kinds of lettuces. And so I've got a different, three different types of lettuces growing in there. Um, and that's a perfect example of how to basically garden in the spring with covers and things of that nature. And then you see the rain barrel behind from the, um, from the garage. Um, and you can see the straw bale. There's a little straw bale there. I have six straw bales this year. Ben, do I have a slide of a straw bale there? Lori, do you remember? There's uh, one in the corner down there, but yeah, I suspect that that's one. the one that I lost or misplaced when I was putting you. it together. Lori, you're, yeah. I'll bet you're right. <laughs> that's the one I'll bet we lost. I have six straw bales. Straw bales are a whole new way of gardening, especially in cities. Um, the straw bale, it takes you about two weeks to prepare it. Um, you basically are composting that straw bale. And so that straw bale starts out as a normal straw bale. As the year goes along, it breaks down into perfect soil. Um, and I grow only tomatoes in there. It's almost blight resistant. There's nothing in the soil that's going to come up into your tomato plants um, because that's virgin soil. And so straw bale gardening is, is literally the way to go in cities. You can put straw bales on asphalt, concrete, whatever, and you can grow whatever you want in a straw bale. Um, and I use them for uh, tomato plants. And I'll bet you the tomato plants last year were six feet high, um, if not higher. Um, it's amazing how they grow in those straw bales. And again, that helps your back. You're not leaning over at all, hardly with the straw bales. So this year I've got six of them. Um, and they're, they're the way to go when you've got limited space. And the straw bale, you can put any place, literally on concrete, as I said. Um, so that's, that's, that's basically, pretty much our program in the backyard. Um, and Lori, you're right. You can eat your way through the summer and eat your way through the fall. <laughs> so you're on. And one of those main things to think about with straw bales is to make sure that you buy straw and not hay because yes. hay will come with seeds. You wanna make sure that you make sure they tell you that it is actually straw. <laughs> yep, thank you, Lori, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. I tried that one time. I have not gone back to it, but it's something that I do need to do again. Yeah. Um, ben, you can go ahead to the next slide. Oh, Steve, oh. you have another one. Oh, the raised gardens. I'm sorry. <laughs> Barbara, this is from your backyard. <laughs> I oh, still well. have this one. <laughs> this is um, when we did the, uh, the water restoration project years ago. We also put raised gardens in our backyards. And this is one, an example of this. Um, this is the raised garden, literally, where I had my uh, compost pile last year, the one that I topped. That soil is literally the bottom of that um, compost pile. That's how rich that soil looks coming out of a compost pile. And that's just the way I just simply boxed it in. Um, I am, I'm going to put peppers in there. But that's what the soil looks like right out of a uh, compost pile. 
Um, and that's a perfect example of the raised gardens. And I have two, two of those. Um, the other one's in the front right here. It's already got potatoes growing, coming up. Um, I planted the potatoes pretty early this year. So Steve, those are the raised up, gardens and those are up about a foot. Do you ever end up with too much soil? No, because <laughs> remember I have those gardens over at Capitol Drive Lutheran with the older adults. Okay. And so the soil goes over there. <laughs> Oh, maybe someday what's going <laughs> okay all right ben next slide and again i'm Lori banks um like i said i i have gardened my entire life um it's something that i absolutely love um i'm one of those people who in january i'm waiting january 2nd for the seed catalogs to come in um, I think I've ordered probably from every company out there as well as in the Milwaukee area. Although one of my favorite places to go is definitely Fred's over on Appleton and Lisbonish. Um, I love that place. Um, although last year it was a get there and get it while you could because the market was hot. Uh, so this is a picture that I actually took this year. Um, and I just love looking at the bees. It freaks my kids out. They don't really like always being in my backyard, um, but uh, you want to see bees. You want to see bees. Sometimes you want to see wasps. You want to see things that will pollinate your, your crops. Um, so I do container gardening. I do herbs and I do fruit. Uh, my thing is I grow to really eat my way through the yard. I, um, I do a few flowers, but I really look for things that are edible. Uh, so next slide. Um, this is my very overgrown elderberry bush. So I'm often looking for, um, for fruits that will help with immunity, um, that are very healthy. And so this is one in which I've grown my elderberries. It started off very small. It has now taken over that corner. Um, so pruning and maintenance is definitely something that you want to do if you're going to grow these things. Um, so this one definitely needs to be pruned back. It's got a couple of issues, but sometimes it's hard to prune after you hit the spring and it's, it's leafed out. So I've got to figure out at this point where I want to go with this, this bush. It actually is now overcrowding. If you go along the wall of the house, my gooseberries and some currants, and then to the uh, left of that area, it's now crowding out my raspberries. So I just have to figure out where we're going uh, with that. It is low maintenance though. Elderberry bushes do not need spray. Um, the birds somewhat like them. I haven't had a lot of problems with birds, but it is a bush that basically you buy two different varieties, stick them in the ground, and you don't have to do much more than that other than wait for them to bloom, and which only took a year, and then start picking those berries. Um, the plant itself though, the leaves and the stems are poisonous. So sometimes you want to watch out depending on what you grow. And whether you have children or whether you have, um, um, I'm sorry, of course, <laughs> family, and whether you have like um, rhubarb that might have poisonous leaves, you wanna be sure that you don't have an animal or children that will start to chew on that sort of thing. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is also that same bush when it is blooming. So this was last, um, last spring. Uh, it is very pretty when it blooms. And then again, it is very pretty when you have the berries on there and they turn to a nice deep purple. Okay, next book, uh, slide. And mm, these are the berries. So these are the elderberries. I do make a lot of jams and jellies. So when it comes to what I grow in my yard, I am constantly making jams and jellies out of my yard, whether they be spice pear jam, uh, whether they be the elderberry, the currants, the gooseberries, the grapes. Um, used to be raspberries until my children really started eating them. So we do eat quite a bit out of my yard. And if your yard is anything like mine, which is a standard Milwaukee city lot, um, it's not big, but you just learn how to plant uh, so that you can accommodate everything that you want or most things that you want. Next slide. Uh, so this is a little picture of the outside of my house. Like I said, I do some flowers, but the primary with my flowers, they are perennials. I, there were years uh, in the past in which my mother and I would go to the 
you know, the garden shops and buy nine, 10 flats of flowers. Those days are over. Um, so I do try to stay with more perennials. And the beautiful thing is most perennials will spread. Uh, you can often find friends or neighbors who have perennials that they either want to dig up or thin out. And that's easy to do. Um, and so that's where, and then the roses actually came with the house when I moved in 18 years ago. So certain things just grow for a long time. All right, next slide. So this is a little snapshot of my yard back in 2000, roughly 2003 or 2004. Um, so you'll notice there's very little in there. Uh, in the first slide uh, on the other side of my niece, there was a peach tree that I put in and then I also put in a grapevine. And then also where my nephew is standing in the bottom slide, it's all grass. So when I bought my house, it was all grass, no fence, and I built everything up. Uh, next slide. It takes time. So now this is a snapshot of, um, of my yard now. And you'll notice where we had grass, we put in a patio. I have planted all of my bushes and trees around the perimeter of the yard so that we have a little bit of uh, sunlight and space. I don't have a lot of room uh, for a formal garden because of the amount of shade from the various trees. So I do a lot of container gardening um, when it comes to vegetables. All right, next slide. And so this is a shot from the backyard. Um, you'll see in, in future pictures, the tree that shades this yard um, had not intended for it to grow 30 to 40 feet, but it did. And luckily it's positioned in such a way that it didn't take up the whole yard. But I literally, if you look towards the left where the garage is, I have grapevines growing along the gutters of the, um, uh, of the garage. I also have grapevines on both sides of my fences. And then I have um, things like rhubarbs, rhubarb at the bottom. So everything can get a little bit of sun. Uh, one little cautionary thing that I would say is if you grow grapes on a fence that you share with a neighbor, um, it can be a very frustrating experience. Uh, like I uh, had happened to me last summer in which the neighbor hired someone to whack the weeds and they thought the vine was a weed. And so before I realized what they were doing, they had cut more than half of my vine down. And if you know uh, grape vines, they intertwine back and forth. So when you cut one part, you might've cut a major segment that's in the yard. Uh, so I am actually reconstructing right now a trellis to keep my vine completely in my yard, even though it was on my fence, because you don't wanna have that difficulty with your neighbors. Um, so definitely plan accordingly when it comes to growing something like a vine. Um, next slide. So this is a little example of the container gardening that I do. Uh, I just get a little potting mix or if my compost pile was like Steve's, I would have a little extra soil to put in the pot. Um, my problem is I don't think I turned mine over enough in, um, in Right now it's so full. I'm gonna have a. I'm gonna have to work with it. I actually moved it. It used to be under one of my pear trees, and I moved it to under one of my grapevines. And so I haven't done a lot with it lately. Uh, Steve, do you put um, chicken wire under your um, under your uh, compost bins? No, I put it right on the ground, and then oh, I didn't. I didn't show that. I have an actual big PVC pipe that I put down the middle and that way it's aerated. And so you have air circulating and in the fall when it starts to really, and when it heats up and the fall when it's frosty, you'll see smoke coming out of it, steam. It actually, <laughs> it's that hot in that compost pile and you'll get steam in the morning coming out of that little pipe. But that makes it, it's all, I got holes all the way through the PVC pipe. And so it aerates itself. So you don't have to worry about that. I know what you're talking about, the wire in the bottom. You don't need it if you have it aerated. Well, the reason I put it there is I've actually had things dig. So I don't know if anyone else has had kind of a rodent issue like I've had in my neighborhood. And I've had things that have burrowed not only under my compost pile, even though it's all vegetable scraps, 
but I also had something that decided it would burrow down around my pond. Um, so I did have a pond in the yard up until yeah. probably towards the end of last summer. And when I spoke to someone from the city, I just took the pond out. If we can cut down on the yard providing a little bit too much or, or too much leisure for something that decided to burrow down there, then that was what I was gonna do. So the pond is now going to be an above ground pond. I have it in mind, I have the uh, water lily, but that's next. <laughs> but Lori, I think that's mm -hmm. a very good point. That's why the new plastic compost piles are required by the city. You can't have the open ones anymore. Okay. Um, so we have to go to those. Uh, you'll get cited if you have an open with a fence frame around it or pallets. Um, okay. They have to be enclosed now. Yeah, we, um, I don't know if you all have noticed, we do have our share of wildlife being in the city. Um, so I know last summer when my pear tree was ripe, I watched a procession of um, raccoons and uh, what are those possums? Possums. Um, parade literally from one alley to my yard. <laughs> that particular night, I didn't go back in the house from the back door because it was just too much for me. Um, but with uh, the container tomatoes, again, I use a little bit of potting soil if I don't have the compost and then just plop the tomato in, um, burying it kind of deep because you know your tomatoes will uh, take a better root if you stick it further down than say where it was originally at in the pot. Uh, next slide. And this is that same tomato uh, a few a month or so later. It was a very prolific tomato. It uh, actually was a little overboard, um, but it was loaded. And, and here it was right sitting along the side of the patio um, where I could reach down and take them and wash them off if I wanted to, or I just let them keep growing. And in some cases, some are probably gonna pop up this year because I just left them in the pot so that they would overwinter. Um, so easy produce to grow in containers are lettuce, herbs, tomatoes, bush cucumbers, potatoes, um, as you'll see in the next slide. So this is um, just the top of one of my potato plants. It decided to bloom and it too was in a pot. Um, usually they say when the potatoes bloom, they're pretty much getting ripe. And then when the foliage dies, then your potatoes are ready. Next slide. And there's a picture of some of the potatoes that I harvested. The pots make it so much easier than trying to dig into the ground. You can just take your pot, put a burlap bag or something like that down. Um, oh, let me write this down. This is one other thing I wanna say about burlap now that I think about that. Um, and you can just dump your pot out and harvest your potatoes without the back breaking work. Um, also, if you ever need anything like burlap, you can actually go to places like the Collectivo down on Humboldt. And um, as of last year, they would give you the burlap bags that the coffee came in for free. And I didn't take a picture of it, but I did do burlap gardening. And so I just put, made a space in my, on the side of my house, put the burlap bag down, filled it. Actually, that was with some compost in the burlap bag and then put a tomato plant right in the burlap bag with the soil. And it was the best tomato I've ever had. I probably harvested 20, 30 tomatoes, uh, which is more than I've had in years. And it was on the Southern side of the house. Lori, right, this mm -hmm. is a prime example of the burlap bag. Okay. That's exactly what they look like. The inside, you just, the soil goes right in there and it breathes right out the base of it. So the water doesn't, the water goes out the bottom if you, over water. Okay. Perfect example of it. And like the ones that you get at Collectivo, they sit a little bit more on the ground. They don't have that structure to them, um, but it's a great way to use a bag and not uh, worry about too many weeds coming up in it. Although I did notice that the, um, apparently I sat it on bulbs. So I did have some tulips and things that somehow made their way through <laughs> and flowered this year. Um, next slide. And then this gives you an example down at the bottom of this picture is the pot of potatoes. You'll see the leaves are kind of falling over. That was towards the end. Um, and those, that was the potatoes or the pot that they were in. And right next to it is this uh, tomato plant that grew out of the crack in the sidewalk of the patio, which I just decided I'd let it grow there. And it turned into this giant monster 
that probably didn't ripen up till mid-September, but then there were hundreds of cherry tomatoes on it. So I just let it grow. Some things, when they come up on their own, uh, you can just let them grow. All right, next slide. Um, this is a little picture of the container gardener, that uh, container gardening with the flowers. I just went to Home Depot and it was a much smaller pot at the time. It was towards the end of July, maybe beginning of August. I wanted some quick color. I had no idea this pot would turn out so well and actually expand, um, but I just purchased it. I actually went ahead and replanted it in a bigger pot with a little compost and it produced all the way through uh, the end of what till the first frost actually and then I brought in the bulbs from these cannas and I have them in the basement um, so one sprouted out I know so I know that give it another week or two with this weather warming up I'll be able to put those cannas out and have those flowers again next slide uh, this is a little example of repurposed metal um, one of my neighbors <laughs> trying to think why they gave me this. It was a whole series of things, but I took it and I just put it on that triangle, put a little bit of a zip tie around it to keep it from collapsing and grew bush cantaloupes on them. Um, and it, I was a little surprised how nice it uh, grew. I wasn't sure when it would be ready. Oddly enough in this picture, it was just about ready. It was one of those personal size ones. Um, if you flip to the next page, I came out one day and it had dropped off and that was it the next day and it was just absolutely delicious. So it's a nice experiment. If you're gonna do the container gardening, again, try to go for the uh, seeds or plants that will fit the pot, like the bush varieties of the cantaloupe, the bush varieties of watermelon or cucumbers. You don't wanna end up with say a regular watermelon seed and then have six feet of a vine in a space that you don't have six feet for. Um, so this is something that works well. All right, next one. Um, so easy to grow, collard greens. For those of you who want a traditional Southern garden, I have a garden which is basically now in the shade, so it can't grow a whole lot. But in the corner, I catch enough sunlight to grow these collard greens. Um, so again, you can go to Fred's and Fred's is one of the rare garden centers that will grow collard greens because um, you'll go everywhere else and it'll be cabbage or kale or something else, but it won't be collards. He grows collards. Or you can actually buy packets of seeds that he sells. sells. Um, and you can get a ton of seeds for a very low price. And now is the time to just start setting them out. Lori, mm -hmm. were they open last year? I thought they had closed. They closed early closed because early. he sold out of everything. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, are they open this year or going to be open this year? I want to say he's open because I think I've seen a yes. delivery come in. He's been open for three weeks. Okay. Yeah. But he, he's one yeah. you got to get too quick. Um, yeah. And, you know, I usually buy the packets of seeds from him and then just start my own. Or in the case of this plant, it ended up going to seed and the seeds reseeded themselves this year. So I actually have collard greens coming up. Um, where the pond used to be. <laughs> so once they get to a nice size, I will actually dig them up, thin them out, and probably put them on the outside of my yard where I have that full sun or part more sun on the southern side of my house. All right, next slide. So fruit trees. I probably have just about every fruit tree or have grown every fruit tree. This is just a small snapshot of my golden spice pear that was in the basic throwaway pile at min Miners at the end of one garden season. That was just the littlest tree that is now turned into the 30, 40 foot tree. Um, this tree is in every other year. So last year was the explosion of pears and this year, I'll probably be fighting with the squirrels uh, for the pears. But um, I was able to make wonderful spice pear jelly and, and, and or jam with these pears. I have to do very little for this tree. My pear trees have not required a lot of maintenance, haven't required a lot of spraying. So for me, I would definitely recommend uh, pears. I have grown peaches. Um, I actually have a cousin who lives a few houses down and she still has one of the peach trees, but they really have a short life at times. 
Um, so as a gardener, you may have to be prepared to plant a tree, let it grow for five years, get the most out of it, and then just cut it down. Um, I had to do that with my apricot trees. I got about five good years out of the apricots, but apricots have some enemies um, in Wisconsin, which are tree borers and everything else. And then they had to be cut down. They've actually now been replaced with apple trees. So uh, Wisconsin tends to be the apple pear plum um, kind of state with everything else being a little bit more exotic. Um, although I can't seem to grow a plum tree in my yard and maybe I have too much stuff and that's probably what the plums are telling me. So yeah, watch the size of the trees. Um, I would recommend if you're going to get an apple and you have small trees and you do need a pollinator, go for the columnar trees. They're small and they're thin and they grow straight up. Um, avoid any standard tree that says, you know, that it'll get to be 20 feet by 20 feet unless you have that kind of yard. Um, and then if you're like me and you end up with this pear, put it at the very back of the yard, which is essentially almost in the alley. Um, and it worked out perfectly. Next slide. I was out yesterday doing my spraying too. I try to do minimal spraying, but I do have to put um, a fungicide on my cherry trees or my cherry tree, which is a three in one. And I do have to sometimes spray a little bit on the apples because apples do require spraying and pears unless you just absolutely want to cut around any worm. Um, so this is the picture of the golden spice pear. And as you can see, it takes up the entire corner. Uh, I did trim it back in the fall or late winter. And so it's not quite that overgrown looking, um, but you can only imagine the amount of pears when the pears fell. Next uh, slide. So this is a little snapshot of when you're uh, growing fruit, you may have to go through and get all those pears up. Although most of those pears went right into the compost pile. Um, you do have to watch out because that's fall for yellow jackets because uh, they, will, they will gravitate towards your fruit trees. And as you see underneath my pear trees, I had uh, my banana trees, oddly enough, sitting there, um, of which when I brought in my oldest banana tree in the in the fall, um, I, it was actually growing bananas. Um, I'll have a picture of that towards the end. Next slide. One of the other things, um, the berries are very low maintenance um, and easy to grow. I grow currants. I make currant jelly, they're wonderful. Um, uh, you can eat them fresh, they're a little bit on the tart side, but berries are very easy to grow in this climate. You pretty much just put them in. Um, so I have red currants, currants, black currants, pink currants. I also have the gooseberries. I have elderberries. I have blackberries. I have blueberries, although blueberries do require a little bit of skill. Um, so that is something you may want to research. You will see more blueberries than ever in the store, but our soil is not uh, correct for blueberries. So you will have to make additions. And what I have learned over the years is when you buy a blueberry bush, also buy a bag of pine mulch because you will want to dig out your hole. You will want to fill half of your hole up with pine mulch, put your berry bush in there, and then put in the rest of your soil and then mulch with pine mulch. Because all of these berries, but, but particularly blueberries, require an acidic soil. Um, Question regarding the berries, the gooseberries, mm -hmm. are they difficult to grow? No, they're very easy. Um, you want to try to find the thornless varieties or they'll make your life. <laughs> miserable <laughs> to pick, um, but I have them and I have not had any problems growing the gooseberries or the currants. Um, you know, one while they were banned. Uh, I think when I first started looking into them, when I was probably a teenager, they were banned in Wisconsin and other places because there was a, was it a fungus or something that traveled from pine trees through currants and gooseberries? Um, and that was lifted, but, um, I know you can get them at Miners. Um, I don't know if I've seen them at the big box retails, but Miners usually has at least the red currants. Um, and I know that's where I've gotten a few of them from, uh, but they make a wonderful jelly. Um, so next slide. So you see what I do during my summer. When I'm not at school, I am uh, 
picking things. Um, so this is a little bit about herbs can be simple. Um, I am one of these people and I singing the song every time I plant my herbs that are in that second picture. That's my poultry mix. So uh, rosemary, sage and thyme. And then I usually add a little parsley in there to have to go with the song. Um, but it's something that the sage came back and usually it will. Um, you can pick that uh, all the way through, let's say November, you can pick it all during this or pick it during this summer and spring and dry it. Uh, the same with the rosemary, it goes wonderful on the grill. So if you have the grill out there, you can just go pull off a sprig, rinse it off and put it with your salmon or your, your poultry dishes right onto the grill. Or sometimes I just kind of drop it on the edge of the fire to get that little bit of, um, you know, seasoned smoke that comes up. I have the thyme. There's so many recipes that call for thyme. I also have the garlic shoots. And in between the garlic shoots, I will grow um, lettuce. Uh, in there. And um, I just really love being able to go out to my yard, pick those fresh herbs. I have a pot of oregano that you don't see in the pictures. Oregano is something that loves to spread. So I keep it in the pot. Um, it comes back and then I don't have to worry about it going everywhere in the yard. Mint will do the same thing. Um, I have chocolate mint and regular mint and they're kind of in an area that they don't go anywhere, but um, you know, if, you, if you're worried about something spreading and you have mint, try to keep it in a pot. But it is so wonderful, again, to go out and you have your lemonade, you might be able to add a couple of leaves to it. And again, in these small containers, it makes growing your herbs so very easy. Uh, next slide. Pests, because there will be pests. You'll think you're going to have the most wonderful crop of something. And then like last year, I looked at those and I said, what are those? Um, I had never seen a stink bug until last spring, last spring, summer. Um, so I have a cherry tree. It's a three in one, which means that there's a main cherry tree with two other varieties grafted on the one tree. So you don't need a second tree for a pollinator. All of a sudden, these things were creeping all over the cherries as they were starting to ripen. Well, they suck the juices out of your fruit. They can cause your fruit to, ripe, uh, to rot. They can cause fungus to spread. Um, and for some reason, the stink bugs seem like they just live everywhere. They spread to the grapevines. Um, so you have to be prepared and uh, research just a little bit on how to take care of these problems. Um, also like the fungus that was on my cherry tree, my cherries would turn a bright red. They looked great. And literally the next day they were a ball of mold on the tree. Um, so we are susceptible in Wisconsin, particularly in the southeastern Wisconsin to fungus to brown rot on cherries on peaches on apricots basically stone fruits um, so that is one reason you need to be prepared to spray and spray early not wait until you see it because if you wait until your cherries start turning you can't save them yes, and it will kill your tree too um, but just google I'm on a Wisconsin gardening Facebook group and I really have picked up a lot more knowledge as well. Although some people are a little avid about invasive species of plants. Some of my stuff in my yard is probably considered invasive such as your lily of the valley, your day lilies, things like that. I still like those things. Um, next slide. So this is why I say never let winter stop you. Um, this is a little bit of my indoor gardening. Um, so the banana on the left hand side, like I said, I happen to bring it in from the yard when it almost was about to hit that freezing temperature. And I had no idea that it was actually growing bananas out there underneath the pear tree. Because at some point you sometimes get tired of your plants <laughs> and you just let them be. It almost got left outside and I brought it in and I couldn't believe it. So this was the first time that any of my banana trees had ever grown bananas. Um, when they finally ripened, they didn't taste like much, but it was just really the adventure of being a gardener and having something like a banana growing in your living room in the middle of January. Um, otherwise, I have grow lights that I have in the basement. I brought my other banana trees in. You'll see at the bottom, I have pineapple plants um, outside of the picture. There are actually fig trees and then some of my flowering plants are in the background. 
Um, this is the time of year that my husband says he'll be glad when it gets warm outside. So all of the six foot trees in our living room can go back out. I also have a avocado tree that's six feet in the living room, a orange tree that's six feet in the living room, a couple of banana trees and a lemon tree. So I'm ready to go outside. <laughs> um, next slide. And one of the things that I also grow are mushrooms. Um, you can go to the winter farmer's market and there's a, an amazing um, farmer who sells you a kit and you can grow these mushrooms, which you can harvest roughly every um, three weeks for about three months. And you can grow these in your basement. And it is just an amazing thing to go down to your basement and you're making something. I did a mushroom soup and just pick your mushrooms fresh and put them right into your meal or into your omelets. Or if you let them grow, they'll turn into those big um, portobello mushrooms. It's amazing. So uh, next slide. So questions. Lori, mm -hmm. um, what do you use for pests? I mean, so I it, saw the sleep bugs last summer. I had a time with Japanese beetles. I mean, what do you use and how do you apply it? And it, it kind of depends. I try to go more organic. Something like the Japanese beetles are really hard to stop. They just, short of going out there and knocking them into a bucket of soapy water, um, there is not a whole lot that will take the Japanese beetles out. Um, you can buy those... Um, they're like little stands that have a scent, but then you can attract everybody else's Japanese beetles to your <laughs> garden spot. So even in the case of those, I will set those stands up kind of in the front of my house where I don't have as many plants to try to attract them to going into the bags in the front. Um, there are different, like the fruit spray that I used on the tree yesterday says it kills Japanese beetles but I would not want to use that spray more than necessary. It smells horrible. Um, apple trees usually take four to five sprayings. I try to bring that down a little bit uh, as I do also have a dog in the yard. Um, I just don't want to have a complete toxic environment going on. But again, that's not to say that I won't use some of those sprays, but I do do dormant oil in the fall and in the uh, late winter. Um, because that's something that you can spray on and it's, it's a lot cleaner than these other things. Um, the fungicides, they still have their issues. But again, if it's between having a cherry or just cutting down the tree, I'm going to try to keep the cherry. Um, and then, uh, like I said, if you have to go sometimes with those apple trees to full fruit spray, um, I'll do those. I also don't do a lot like with weed and feed. We have an argument in my household over weed and feed. Um, the grass on the outside yard is my husband's. So I have to respect that and put that down, although <laughs> he won't put it down himself. Um, but the grass on the inside yard is mine, which looks much better. And I have an organic fertilizer that I use. Um, he also says he can't grill cause he can't handle smoke, but he's a retired firefighter. So that's a whole nother story. <laughs> I think Lori, the other thing is the, uh, soap. Um, types of sprays. Yes. I use those and those are much safer. Yeah. Um, and, and that pretty much cuts down on the, on the pests. Right now I'm trying to find something that will rid me of so many flies. Um, I'm actually yeah. surprised at this point uh, of the year where we're not even warm yet. I seem to have a lot of flies. Um, so I've either got to figure out what's attracting them or if it's just the fact that everything is blooming. Hey, I'm, I'm going to jump in. This is Mabel. Um, I'm just reading one of the questions that came in from the chat from Monique oh, yeah. Phillips. And Monique wants to know, do your berry bushes require a lot of sun? The currants don't. Uh, the currants are a part sun, part shade. And I've had awesome harvests with those. The raspberries do like a little more sun. Um, I've gotten away with a lot in my yard, so I have a lot of shade. So it's going to be, it depends on what it is, but I don't have a lot of problems with the berries that I grow and the currants probably get the least, they don't get as much sun and they do very well. And Steve? 
Raspberries well, are full sun. They love sun. Lori, uh huh. Can you use the burlap bags for tomatoes or just other things? I'm a new gardener. And yeah, what I use them you for, to get the burlap bags at. Um, I use them for tomatoes, okay. and I've gotten them before down at the Collectivo on Humboldt, where they have their major roasting operation. Anybody know what that side street is? Yeah. But it's it's that main collectivo off down Humboldt. on on Humboldt, Humboldt right off yeah. of um, Center. Locust. Locust, is, yeah. Is Locust what runs past Riverside? Yes, Locust. So it would be right off of Locust, Locust and, Humboldt and Humboldt to the north. Okay, and yeah. you can put the tomatoes in the bird. I'm a new gardener. You can put tomatoes in the bird lot. Yeah, you you, put, you just mm -hmm. kind of roll the bag down and then add fill it up with your soil and then just plant your tomato right there in it and. I had wonderful success with that this year, this past year. And you recommend men using a potting soil instead of regular soil? Uh, regular soil can be too heavy. Okay. Um, so you want to have something that won't weigh it down. Uh, what they call topsoil today yes. might not be topsoil. I got shells in the last bag of topsoil that I bought. Okay. And I don't know where we have seashells okay. or snail shells, but it was the weirdest and it smelled funny. Um, so be wary of especially low price topsoil because um, it's a little sketchy these days. Okay, thanks very much. And sis, sis, it's real important that the watering, when the, the tomatoes are in these bags, you really have to watch for the watering. If they dry out too much, then they start to suffer and your, your production won't be that great. Any other questions? Yeah, I have uh, a question. Yes. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. I did, had a question about using the rain barrels. Um, I'm in a couple of gardening groups, and I had mentioned that I was going to get a, a rain barrel installed, and they said that to, not to use the water from the rain barrel on, like, fruit or vegetable-bearing plants because of the, the roof, material on the roof. Have you had any issues with that? Not, not a single issue, and I've been using them for at least eight years. Okay. I've, I've never had a problem. Um, I've got a screen on the top so that that screens out any of the particles from the um, roof, um, okay. and not a problem. Okay, thanks. And my last question is, um, I've seen some uh, uh, potatoes being done in like, um, what are those? Hampers. And yeah. where they have the holes, and then they put the uh, coconut, coconut something in it. Cocoa and, shells. Yes, and they use that to line the so to hold the soil in. Has anybody done that before, or had experience with that here? And that works perfectly because then the shoots of the tomatoes come out the little holes. Yes. So it grows. That that's perfect. That's exactly the way you should do it. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question about the rain barrel. How do you get the uh, force, the water to come out of the rain barrels? The rain barrel right at the bottom. Hang on a second. I'm right next to one of them. Did you see the bottom of it? Well, right no. there's the spigot. Okay. Right on the bottom of the rain barrel. And the top is the overflow spigot. And then you can see the screen right on the top. Right. I one, but I couldn't get the water to come out. In, at the bottom? Right. It had no force. It, so it's just, over the winter, it burst. You know, I think I'm so cold. I didn't bring it in. So. Oh. I yes. know, I know. Oh, that's the cardinal sin of um I know, but I couldn't get it to, the water to come out of there. It's probably, it seals itself and make sure it's drained out and then reach down in there with a screwdriver and then just pop it open. Um, what happens in the winter when it seals itself up from the ice? Yeah. The, the, actually the, the opening in the bottom swells shut and you need to just puncture it open again and then it should flow. Oh, okay. Well, I just got to get me a new one, but I did have- Yeah, you're better off with a new one. 
now I can't do anything. Yeah, that's the cardinal sin. You always have to, I'm on, on mute. No. in the winter, flip those things over. All that water's got to be out of that rain yeah. barrel. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. As a reminder, come on uh, May 22nd, which is uh, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, um, Ethan Taxman will be at um, our event in the park, our Earth Day in the Park event, so that if you want to sign up for a rain barrel, typically they can accommodate residents from Sherman Park. All you have to do is sign up with him. They come um, and they also install them. And he is, um, hmm, I forgot which group he's with. It's not the Water um, Commons. It is Clean Wisconsin. Clean yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Joe. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I did want to get over into a couple of more questions. It's seven o'clock, and I did want to touch base with um, Joe Fitzgerald to talk a little bit about the trees. Were there any more questions for uh, Lori and Steve? There are a couple of questions in um, the uh, chat. So I'm going to read the question from Grace Mooney. Grace wanted to know. Um, if there's any recommendations of someone who can install more gutters on her garage and tie the runoff into my water barrels that I have. Um, oh, you know, Grace, um, if you want to get a hold of me, um, we had someone just put, our neighbor did the exact same thing a week ago, and I can get you the name of the person. Um, so... Um, I'll put my email address and phone number in the chat and then just whistle me and I'll get you lined up with him. He just did it for the neighbor over here. So that'll work. Okay. And thank you for that, Steve. Patricia Parcell, um, she wants to know what do you do for squirrels that eat the fruit? Does cayenne pepper work? Also, where can, where can she buy or what do you do for squirrels that eat the fruit? Does cayenne pepper, okay, it's the same question. And where can I buy tomato cages that um, are really tall? She says her tomatoes uh, went wild last year. Um, they were hard to pick with all of the vines intertwined. Thank you. And again, she wanted to know how she, can she get the squirrels out of eating her fruit trees? Yeah, the squirrels are a hard one. Um, I have a, a resident squirrel, although he may be gone now because the nest looks really bad. And so years like this year with the pear tree, we would be fighting over the last pear. Um, I have tried water <laughs> in the tree. Um, cayenne pepper works to a certain extent because um, the only problem with it is that you have to keep reapplying it after every rain. Um, that is a hard one. That's almost like saying, how do you keep the raccoons out of the grapes? I've learned not to go into my arbors at night because um, I had a case where some eyes were looking back at me. Um, I don't want to say that you have to sometimes grin and bear it, but Steve, do you have a better recommendation? My solution you? is they're called have a heart traps and I just relocate them. Oh, the relocation. You have to get water a river stream between you and them. Uh, they will not go across a river or a stream. Um, and so I take them over to, um, on the other side of Hart Park, um, in the reservoir over there. Um, and that way, I don't see them ever again. And I, there are years where I relocate 30 squirrels. They love my garden, it drives me nuts. Um, and, <laughs> <clears throat> they're gone and I'm down to maybe two squirrels. I've only seen two squirrels this year. Last year, Lord. And just teases my, my wife because I just throw them in the back of the car when we go for a walk and I relocate them someplace. <laughs> yeah, have a I heart is, called, is actually what the traps are. And just put some nuts or peanut butter in there and 10 minutes later you got a squirrel. Okay. I got one last question from Asher, and then we'll go to um, uh, Joe. Um, the dia, um, let's see, do you have any experience using diatomaceous earth? Is that what I'm, as a uh, pesticide, am I pronouncing it? Diatomaceous, okay. 
I have not used it, but I have heard that it does work. Um, yeah. I know that's not a very complete answer, but yeah, I've, I've heard of it, but I have not used it. Okay. And then Bernadette Duvall had another question about um, how to keep feral cats out of her garden. I probably have not had as many pest problems because I have a dog. Um, so he has managed to run certain things out and he unfortunately has a tendency to like to find the little rodents and play with them till he kills them. Um, so I have not had to deal with, I kind of wish we had more cats in the neighborhood because if we had cats, we wouldn't have as many mice or rats. Um, mm. I don't know what, do you know what might be attracting the cat to your garden? Bernadette, if you want to come off mute. And then we're going to go over to Joe so we can talk a little. Okay, wait a minute. She's quick. Looks like she, oh, okay, another question. Oh, the neem oil I do use. Neem oil, um, which is also usually dormant oil, um, I spray on the trees. Um, you can do the neem during, I believe, all year round because I want to say I actually sprayed that on my lemon trees for scale. Um, that's the one thing if you get citrus trees, they can pick up scale and you'll start wondering why the leaves are falling off. And if you look real closely, your bark will look lumpy and it's these little scaly things that live on your tree till they kill it. I have gotten to the point where I actually just use my fingers or use a, um, use like a cotton ball and just wipe them off. Okay. Lori, thank you for that. We are going to switch gears for a moment. Thank you for all your knowledge, Steve and Lori on gardening. Um, we'll make sure this recording goes on Facebook um, so that you can review it. Um, but what I wanted to do is touch base with Joe Fitzgerald from the Water Commons. Um, he did want to share a little bit of information about trees. And um, if you do have any questions regarding new trees that may have been um, uh, planted in front of your home, or if you know anyone, maybe a couple doors down, we need to make sure that these trees are maintained and watered. Um, so at 707, Joe, if you would like to come on board, unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks, Mabel. Um, I do have a presentation if it's possible to share my screen, but otherwise I can just talk about trees on the streets as well. That's totally fine. Um, maybe that'll be that'll be easier for now. That's to that's totally fine. So, um, hey everybody, my name's Joe Fitzgerald. Uh, I work with. Oh, I think I might. Be you do have screen sharing privileges. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that worked, everybody? Okay, thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Joe Fitzgerald. I, I work with an organization called Milwaukee Water Commons. And I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quickly here just because I don't wanna take up too much time at the end of the call here today, um, but do appreciate uh, you all having me with you. Uh, Milwaukee Water Commons is a cross-city network. We're a nonprofit organization that really, I say, focuses on connecting communities around Milwaukee and uh, using water as a medium. Mm -hmm. um, and we do this under a few shared frameworks, uh, the Jemez principles, which are uh, environmental justice principles, um, collective impact, really trying to bring partners together to not recreate the wheel. Um, the commons protecting uh, resources kind of as a shared good, especially of water as something that we all have a, a, you know, a relationship with and community engagement, recognizing that community engagement and leadership is really critical to anything we do in our city. Um, and I'm here talking about trees um, because as somebody who talks about water, uh, trees have you know, as you heard today, watering has a lot to do with trees and trees also have quite a bit to do with uh, water. And so Milwaukee Water Commons has been a, a partner on an effort called the Branch Out Milwaukee Campaign. Um, that's really looking at trying to 
increase the number of trees in the city of Milwaukee uh, and increase the maintenance of those trees so that we can have trees that really support our communities, have the benefits of trees um, so that you know residents have all those benefits. And, and what we had found out was that looking around the city of Milwaukee, um, that even though we do have, uh, have trees and lots of green spaces, uh, the amount of green spaces, the amount of trees are not equal uh, around the entire city. Um, and so there are some, there are neighborhoods around Milwaukee that um, do not share, do not have as many trees. And so, you know, this, these maps that are on here today are really looking at trees in public spaces. There might be a number of reasons why we might have barriers to having trees in, in neighborhoods, but um, working together, planting trees in public spaces or on private property, um, we're hoping to change that story. The city has, has a goal to increase its tree canopy to deal with threats of climate change. And we want to, um, we want to do that for the, the really the health benefits of that trees have. So <clears throat> these are some of the benefits of trees that we think about in terms of, you know, filtering water, prevent, for preventing water from, um, you know, flowing into the deep tunnel, kind of as Steve mentioned, the, the work that had been done in the Sherman Park neighborhood in the past to hold water where it falls. Trees do a really good job of that. Um, they can prevent flooding. They can also, by blocking out um, the sun, can really cool temperatures um, in your neighborhood and also on your uh, in your house as well, um, reducing energy costs. Um, fruit trees, like Lori was talking about, can uh, increase access to fresh foods. Um, trees generally filter air um, and are really important in terms of preventing some public health issues uh, like cardiovascular disease um, or um, respiratory diseases like asthma. They, they filter out particulates that can really um, you know, help healthier communities. And um, they also provide uh, employment for folks who take care of trees and plant trees and, and do that maintenance work. Uh, and so I know Mabel was just mentioning that there's a lot of city or a lot of trees popping up around the city. Uh, and so we want folks to kind of be tracking about why that's important uh, or why folks are trying to bring trees into the city. We've lost a lot of trees in the past from pests like the Dutch elm disease was the big one uh, in the city of Milwaukee. We lost a huge chunk of our, our trees in the city. Um, and nowadays it's the emerald ash borer, um, which is kind of the new pest that's, that's wiping out trees. And so um, we're trying to, yeah, I think that that's probably a lot of the reason why we're seeing new trees pop up is that the city forestry is really spending a lot of resources to remove those trees and then replace them with new trees. Uh, but we wanna make sure that folks are aware that that's happening and, and can kind of be a partner in helping those trees survive to, to reap these benefits on Milwaukee neighborhoods. Um, I have a few slides just on planting trees generally, and I'll maybe go through this quickly and then try to focus on, on just tree care. But as, as Lori was mentioning, one of the biggest things to consider when you're talking about planting a tree is to think about where, where exactly you're planting it and what it, you know, a tree can be really small when you get it, but it can grow to be pretty big <laughs> and you don't want your tree to turn out to be a burden. Um, you also want to think about why it is that you're planting a tree. You might want a fruit tree, you might want a shade tree, uh, and different trees will grow to different capacities. Um, and trees planted in, diff uh, trees grow in different spaces based on, you know, what kind of soil is there, uh, you know, how much sand versus dirt, the, how compressed that soil is um, based on how much sunlight they get, just like any other plant, um, and how much water is in the soil. Make sure you look out for um, power lines when you're planting things in your yard, but also think about the pipes that are under the ground as well. Um, I put a number on here for a digger's hotline. They, they generally ask that you call folks before you start digging holes in your yard, but you never know. I mean, Part of that is just uh, that they want you to do that, but it's also a safety issue too. You never know what you're gonna end up digging up. Um, when you go to get a tree, folks generally talk about trees either by caliper, container size and height, and that can get kind of confusing. If folks talk about caliper or height of trees, it's probably because the trees are grown out in the field. Uh, container size, there can be all sorts of different container sizes. And when you're thinking about trees being planted, a ball and burlap tree is probably what you're seeing the city plant on out in front of your house. It can be really heavy. 
Um, so you might need like a forklift or something, or at least a big strong person. Um, so think about that if you're requesting those trees. Uh, bare roots trees are, are um, really uh, easy to move around, obviously, uh, but they require a lot of water. They need to be planted pretty much right away when you get them. And container trees are kind of the, you know, the mix in between. Um, you can keep them growing in the container for a little while and plant them later, uh, or you can, or you can plant them right away. This one is, is related to both trees that you might plant, but also trees that you see the, the city plant. Um, most of the trees that the city are planting, I mean, it, I should say all the trees that the city are planting are being planted by arborists, folks who are really specialized in trees. So you shouldn't run into a lot of these problems, but it is good to just keep an eye out on the health of your tree. Um, something I picked up from a partner of ours is to remember RIF, um, which is this a weird ac acronym for roots, injuries, and form. Um, but you wanna keep an eye out for the healthier tree when you're looking at it. If you have an opportunity to look at roots, if you're taking something out of a container, um, you wanna watch out for roots that might be crushed or torn, um, avoid roots that just look all balled up in the, in the container. Um, you wanna watch out for injuries. Uh, and also when you're maintaining trees, make sure not to cause injuries. You know, if you're carrying a tree around in your car, it can bump into things and rub off some of the, um, the bark. Um, you know, when, when folks are pruning trees, they might cut a little deeper than they mean to. Um, we learned the other day about the plot on 55th and Center, the, um, that when you're doing your um, weed whacker around the base of the tree, that can cut into the base of the tree and damage the bark. So you wanna watch out for things like that. There are also holes and things like that might, that might come from bugs that break into trees. Um, and you also wanna watch out for branching. It's really best to do this with an early tree to look for cracks in the branches or branches that look like they're kind of squeezing together or might not grow out evenly um, because it's easier to uh, take care of those issues with a young tree rather than with a tree that's, you know, 60 feet tall. So um, encourage keeping an eye out for how your tree is growing in front of your yard or in your yard. Um, Planting a tree, I'll, I'll skip through this slide quite a bit, but as you can imagine, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, you really want to plant your trees either in the late fall after the leaves fall or in the early spring when the buds bloom. Um, but there's a lot of things that go into, into planting a tree. Um, it's easiest to make sure that your tree grows properly if you, if you make sure that it's planted straight when you first, when you first put it in the ground. And it's really important to do watering right away. Those are the two things that I'll kind of pull from this slide. Um, but then caring for your tree, this is the, the bulk of what Mabel was asking me to talk about. Um, new trees require a lot of water. Um, at least every five days, you should really be getting trees uh, watered and you want to water a new tree about 20 gallons uh, a week. So you're looking at uh, quite a bit of watering over the course uh, as it's first getting planted. Really, you want to do that for at least the two year, first two years while the tree is establishing itself. Bigger trees take longer to establish than smaller trees, but smaller trees require water while they're growing. So um, it's just a good rule of thumb to water that much. Um, you can request tree bags from the city. Uh, that's what's pictured up here in the, in the corner. Um, tree bags allow the, the water to just leak slowly into, into the ground. Um, I also, we also recommend putting mulch around trees because it can help with preventing weeds from popping up. Uh, it can also will keep your tree warm in the winter and can hold a lot of that moisture in the ground so you don't have to water quite as frequently. Um, you wanna make sure that when you're watering that your water is leaking in slowly though. Pruning is really best um, left to the, uh, to the experts if you, can, if you can manage it, but there's some small pruning that you can do to make sure, like Lori was talking, to make sure that it's not butting into your house or not butting into your um, power lines or something like that. Um, Really some of the three, three of the things that I pulled up here to take a look at are to trim back suckers. Suckers are what they call these little, um, little spurts of trees that come up 
little branches that come up from the roots um, near the base of your tree. Uh, you can cut those back at the beginning of the year and that prevents the tree from growing in like weird directions at, it, at its top. Um, you can train your trees. It's best to do some of that light trimming in the winter and the early spring. Again, it'll probably be easier to do it at those times too because the leaves won't be as, as dense. Um, but this is, uh, you know, it's an opportunity to cut things back so that they aren't um, going to damage any of your property. And then the biggest thing is to keep an eye out for pests, especially, um, and diseases like the, what, what Lori was mentioning, seeing in the cherry trees. It can happen to, to all sorts of different trees and there's different pests for different trees. What I have pictured here on the side is the emerald ash borer um, that I mentioned. If you have an ash tree in your yard, um, keep an eye out for these little green bugs or for these little D-shaped holes that can happen in your in your bark. Um, if that's happening to your tree, it probably needs to come down. Um, and then I just wanted to also point folks in the direction of a few partners that have a lot of really good info on trees and tree care and are good to reach out to about any of this stuff. Um, Greening Milwaukee is a nonprofit here in Milwaukee that um, will give, they, they hand out free trees um, to folks who are interested, really just small trees to care for um, till they grow bigger. Uh, but they also have a lot of helpful tips on how to plant trees and how to, how to take care of trees. Um, Johnson's Nursery is a, a partner that we work with for some of our tree plantings. Um, they're good for consultation and, and purchasing trees, but they also just have a knowledge base on, online. It's like a little library of tree tips, something I'd recommend taking a look at. And then the city forestry division is especially for the trees in front of your house. Um, that's a great place to call if you're seeing any issues, if you're you know, having a trouble with watering or however, um, just to give a call to the city forestry. You can also um, put comments in on online. Um, thanks everybody. That's my, my quick presentation. I hope that was good. <laughs> well, Joe, one of the things that, as we've talked about on Mondays, is trying to get people to adopt a tree. Um, so do you have any suggestions as to what people could do on their block as far as people adopting the four or five trees that sometimes are on the blocks? A lot of people are tenants and they're not all that engaged. So I think it's really imperative for all of us who are engaged in our blocks to get people to adopt a tree. So you wanna talk a little bit about maybe some ideas for that? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Steve. Um, yes, Steve's right. So, you know, we're seeing trees popping up around the city. And once a tree is planted by city forestry, they still will, you know, help with oversight. They'll do the maintenance of that tree in terms of pruning. Um, but for watering, um, it's a really good, it, it would be, it's, it's important that we as folks in the neighborhood are, are making sure that those trees are maintained. So, really those two pieces that I was talking about there, either helping with the watering of the trees or just keeping an eye on the tree to make sure there aren't bugs popping up there, the, you know, that it's growing in a way that isn't gonna damage anything. If you see trees where there's like branches gonna fall on your house or on your car, um, give a call to the city um, to make sure that those things don't happen. They will send somebody out to help with that. Um, otherwise, as trees are popping up in the neighborhood, um, super, super helpful to have folks be watering those trees because we want to make sure that they grow healthily and, um, you know, with a little bit of love, uh, trees, trees still do their thing. Joe, is it possible to overwater them? It is possible to overwater trees for sure. Um, yeah, and, and it's like, you know, like any other plant, it's kind of hard to tell if you're underwatering or overwatering trees. That, um, that, that 20 gallons, tip is, is kind of what I've heard is the best, best method. But to be honest, like, I, that's just a lot of water too. So I, I, don't, know. I, have, I don't see folks overwater trees too often. Uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, the rain is your friend as well. Um, and otherwise, just try to make sure that they're getting watered every five days. I think that's, that's the best we can ask of folks, right? All right. Thank you, Joe. I, I wanted to um, go to the chat um, Joe, uh, Doris Wallace is asking for your contact information. So if you can put that in the chat for everyone on the call, that would be awesome. 
And again, if you do have trees, please make sure that they're watered. Um, you, you know, this can only help with the health of our community um, as a whole. Now, I'm gonna go to another question. Um, Monique Phillips wanted to know, Joe, um, when is the best time to prune a tree? Season-wise, um, she said she needs to trim a tree in her backyard from her house, but she's concerned that she may have cut the tree in the wrong spot. Oh, okay. Help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll do what I can. Um, I will say the best the best time to to trim a tree if you're going if you're gonna go in and do it is either in the winter or in the early spring before the buds come in. Um, and that, you know that's that's because that's when the tree is dormant, and so um, it, trees will put a lot of their energy into growing in different ways. And if so, if they're in the process of growing, um, you don't want to cut them because you might end up cutting something that they didn't want you to cut. But if they're dormant, then you can trim it back and they'll, they'll grow appropriately during the growing season. Um, that being said though, um, tree trimming is definitely a profession. So I think um, you can trim a tree in a way that it, it does damage the tree. Um, you gotta kind of hope that it grows, grows back or otherwise I think call somebody who um, can help with to look at it. So we have a couple minutes left. Um, I know you have been working with Northcott Neighborhood uh, House to um, work with the Arborist Program. And if you can share a little bit about what that program is, that would be helpful, I think, for people sharing information to the community. Definitely. Yeah, thank you for that plug, Mabel. Um, so Milwaukee is actually in a pretty cool spot with um, with trees. We're the first state to have an apprenticeship program for becoming an arborist, which is somebody who takes, who works on trees and tree maintenance. And then Milwaukee is the first city to have a pre-apprenticeship program. And the goal really is to get folks into uh, living wage employment. These folks probably know apprenticeships are this four-year program that give, grow you into a certified, uh, into some certification where you can be a tree trimmer pretty much anywhere in the, in the country. Um, the pre-apprenticeship program is really meant to be a pathway for folks who don't know that much about trees, but are interested in learning more um, to gain some of those skills and then connect directly with an employer um, so that they can begin on that apprenticeship pathway. And, and that is, that's being organized by the Northcott Neighborhood House um, Northcott Neighborhood House, it's a six, I want to say it's a six week program um, that folks with, with a stipend um, where folks will go through kind of a course on um, the basics of tree care, tree trimming, they'll get, they'll get folks out doing some of those things, learning the, the basic skills. And then I believe they're connected with um, nine employers to, to get folks into, um, into an apprenticeship right, up, right out of that program. Um, but that's a great, great plug. <laughs> Oops, does anyone else have questions for I Joe? I have a quick one. Sure. Joe, you know, I have planted so many trees over the years, but I have never asked before, like I just put in a bare root uh, freedom apple tree and I have never used a water bag. It would probably be a really good idea is that supposed to go on the tree before or after you plant it? After, after you plant it. Definitely. After you plant it. Okay, so yeah. now would be the best time for me to go ahead. And it was bare root. So bare root tend to be a really thin tree. Yeah. Is that going to be too heavy on the tree or? It, it, well, it depends when you say bare roots. I mean, so sometimes bare roots can be really, really small. And at that point, they, you probably won't fit. But once you it's see about one, a five foot tree but it's it's not real thick you know it's about five feet tall right now yeah they make sorry were you gonna say something steve mm -hmm. it oh. should be fine because it's only about two feet but yeah yeah it should be fine yeah. okay and they'll, they make they'll make different kinds of watering bags too there are some mm. that just like hang on the tree and its branches there are some that just kind of sit on the ground um and so you might just look into you know what one makes sense but I think the thing to remember is that a watering bag is holding like, you know, maybe 10 gallons of water. And so um, just make sure that your, your trunk can support that much weight. 
if it's going to be um, hanging on the tree. Yeah. The, the key is really just to make sure that the water seeps in really slowly for the tree. Um, and so that's what the watering bag basically replicates. So you don't have to stand there with the hose for a long time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Are there any more questions for our experts? It is 729 and we want to be mindful. Um, uh oh, I think I got another question for <laughs> uh, from Grace. Grace, uh, let's see, question about getting city to trim trees. Okay. If you can give her a quick um answer to that question about how to get the city to trim trees if you can put it in the chat that would be awesome but i i do think we need to wrap up um it is 7 30 i want to be mindful of our time um if there are folks who still want to hang out after uh, we kind of wrap up this event please feel free to hang on we'll have an after chat um <laughs> So um, I thank you all for joining us. I hope you have learned um, a lot of information for maintaining um, gardens in your own backyard, soil composting, um, trees, uh, fruit bearing trees, um, container gardening. Um, I will always say Sherman Park residents come with all the information. These are our regular folks um, who are extraordinary folks who live in Sherman Park. And, um, you know, folks are always able to help with information. Please tune in again um, to any of our webinars so that we can also inform you as community residents. And then also, if there's things that you want to share with with us or things you wanna hear, um, different webinars you'd like to hear from, please let us know. Again, um, some of the dates, May 22nd, which is Saturday, um, May 22nd next week, please join us at the park at 9.30. Then on May 24th, there is our tree blessing on 55th and Center. And then also another event coming up June 10th, will be our um, hosting of Milwaukee Shines, which is the solar program um, from the city. So we'll have a representative from there also talking about how you can get solar panels from your home. So with all of that being said, again, I thank you all for joining us. If you wanna hang out, feel free to do so, um, but this will conclude our night and thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Steve, Lori, and Joe. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank pleasure. you, everyone. Yeah. And I, Lori, Hi. 